Oh man, here we go. This is probably the coolest thing that I've ever got to do for this YouTube channel. Hey, what's up everybody? I'm out here in Providence, Rhode Island. I got this postcard from about 1910. It's supposed to show where Roger Williams first landed his boat here in Rhode Island on the shore of the Seekonk River right here. I'm trying to find that monument on the postcard, but I just can't see it anywhere. Like he was supposed to have landed on the shore of the Seekonk and this is the Seekonk, so where is it? Where's the landing spot? Oh, hey, what's this? Wait. That's the monument right there. Where, where, where the heck? You can see that monument from here if you turn around and look across Gano Street between the two buildings on the far side of the soccer field. Okay. What? Well, wait. Well, what the heck is it doing way over there? Yup, here we are at the Roger Williams Landing Monument, a few hundred feet away from the shore. Weird, right? How could this be the spot where Roger Williams landed his boat if it's so far away from the Seekonk River over there? Well, as we can see from this map I found from an 1835 City of Providence land survey, this spot wasn't always so far from the water. See, there it is right there. Slate Rock, landing place of Roger Williams. Slate Rock, by the way, is supposed to be the exact stone that Roger Williams first stepped foot on when he walked off the boat. There's about a billion paintings and drawings of it. Like, look, here's one, here's another one, and you know, since you've been listening so politely so far, here's one more, just for you. So what happened, right? Well, in the few hundred years since Roger Williams supposedly landed here, the river has been partially filled in by humans to make room for new buildings and streets and stuff like that, right? This is a process called land reclamation, and it has drastically reduced the width of the Seekonk River at this spot. Here, let's crack open this giant atlas I found at a local library here in Providence and you'll see what I mean. Here's a map from 1881 and look at that. They were kind enough to draw the new streets and dotted lines over top of the shape of the original coastline. And hey, right about here is where Slate Rock used to be. Pretty interesting, right? At least I think so. That's why I decided to make this video in the first place. But I gotta be honest with you guys. I gotta come clean. I gotta tell the truth. When I originally started putting this video together, I was thinking it was gonna be like two or three minutes tops, right? I was thinking I was gonna show up with my postcard, line it up to the monument, explain the whole land reclamation thing, and bing, bang, boom, that'd be a video. Like two days of work tops, right? But no, I've been working on this video for weeks now. And let me tell you, I've ended up some places I never expected to go, and I did some things to make this video that I never thought I would do. Because the more I looked into the story of Slate Rock, the more I uncovered this whole world of information that I just completely was unaware of. But before we get into all that, we gotta start at the beginning. So let's start off with just the simple, traditional story of Roger Williams and Slate Rock. Now, if you don't know who Roger Williams is, that's all right. I'm not gonna go too deep into his whole life history or anything like that. That's a whole video for another time. All you really need to know for this story is that he was a minister up in Salem, Massachusetts who got banished from the whole Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1635, mostly for preaching against the King and Church of England. After his banishment, Williams and a few followers made the long trek down here, over 50 miles, to right around this area, which is modern-day Rumford, Rhode Island. Then they started up a small settlement here for a while until a representative from the Massachusetts Bay Colony came down and was like, yo, sorry to bother you, but you're actually technically still on the land of the Massachusetts Bay Colony right here, so get the heck out of here. So Williams and his supporters packed up into some canoes and set out into the Seekonk River. Now here's where the story gets messy. Tradition says that as Williams went down the coast here, a bunch of Native Americans from the Narragansett tribe called out to him and hailed him over to the shore. As he landed on Slate Rock, they welcomed him with a little greeting. What cheer, knee top? Which is basically just kind of like a hodgepodge of Old English and Narragansett language. Basically, it just means, what's up, buddy? Anyway, though, they talked for a bit on top of the rock, and then Williams took off and sailed around the shoreline here and ended up landing for good, right around here, where he established the town of Providence, Rhode Island. And that's the tradition. But I gotta tell you, there is a ton of debate over whether the whole thing shook down like that. Modern historians are very divided on this story, and it's not just some new debate either. As long as there has been writing about Slate Rock, there has been disagreement about it. 
take it from me. I spent a whole lot of time in Providence, Rhode Island's, you know, local libraries and stuff like that, doing research for this video, trying to quietly unfurl the most gigantic, crinkly maps I've ever seen in my entire life without annoying the rest of the library. And looking through these huge five volume book series, thousands and thousands of pages that only had a itty bitty little three page index at the very back. Check this out, here's the index for all these books. Plus this one. But it was all worth it because I found so many different accounts of this Slate Rock story and Roger Williams uh, landing in Providence. And they're all different. Like, let me show you a few examples. Like, here's a good one to show how the basic traditional Slate Rock story is usually told. Roger Williams got kicked out of Massachusetts. He paddled out into the water, landed on Slate Rock. The old what cheer pleasantries were exchanged and then Williams set back out on his way. Here's another one from an 1891 history of Providence County. Landed, exchanged greetings, what cheer, the whole nine yards. I should mention, by the way, that what cheer has become a bit of a slogan for the city of Providence, to the point where it's even enshrined on the city's official seal. Anyway, though, one thing that's pretty easy to spot when you're reading these accounts of the Slate Rock story is that the majority of them that tell that traditional story almost always start with something like, according to local legend, blah, 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 or the story that's been passed down is blah, 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 traditionally blah 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 you know it always starts with some little qualifier like that which leads us into probably my favorite little thing i found looking through all these history books it's from a history book written in 1920 the author is talking about roger williams going across the sea conch here and he says the earliest tradition the date has not been accurately ascertained it is a matter of conjecture this interpretation it is possible the theories meager records, unauthenticated copy of a deposition are the staple introductions to all the probable or improbable stories of that water journey. So he's like literally making fun of how every single account of this Slate Rock story has to start off with some kind of, you didn't hear this from me kind of thing, right? There's some other pretty interesting little tidbits in this particular book too, like here where the author says that he heard a version of the story from a senator who heard from a judge whose sister was related to someone who supposedly was actually on the boat with Roger Williams, right? So that's like several degrees of separation. But basically this version of the story says that Roger Williams went out into the water with just one other guy. And while they were in the water of the sea conch, a few members of the Narragansett tribe waved to them from the shore and said, what cheer, knee top. Roger Williams signed back a few messages and then kept going down the river. So he never landed on the rock. He just heard the what cheer, knee top, communicated a message back, and then went on his way. I should say though, that this whole thing doesn't just end with disagreement on details though. There's plenty of history books that just flat out say that the Slate Rock story is probably not true. Like here's one from 1918. The other tradition that there were five or six in the canoe and that they landed on a slate rock has little to no historical value. Or here's one from 1886 that goes even further. There is nothing more than this vague tradition so recorded to show that Williams landed at Slate Rock. But either way, whether this story is true or not is always going to be tough to say for sure, mostly because Roger Williams and his followers really did not write anything down themselves about their journey across the Sea Conch. And to make it even more confusing, a pretty sizable portion of the small amount of writing that they actually did do was burned to a crisp during the King Philip's War. I mean, there's pretty much just like a, a total lack of primary sources here, to the point where we don't even know exactly for sure what day or even what month Roger Williams actually first went across the Sea Conch. And hey, one last thing before we move on though. I did want to mention that the very oldest source that I found on Roger Williams Crossing, a series of newspaper articles from 1765, just completely doesn't mention Slate Rock or the what cheer thing at all. Not one word about Williams meeting anybody on a rock or getting called out to or anything even remotely like that. And this is far and away the oldest recording of the story I found too. Not just by like a couple years, but by like several decades, 40 years or so. 
And to be honest, I found a similar pattern in any old maps I was able to dig up too. Like sure, Slate Rock is listed on a bunch of old maps, like those ones I showed you at the top of the video. But again, it seems like the further you go back in time, the less likely you are to see Slate Rock on these maps. Like here's the very oldest map I was able to find from way back in 1777. And look at that, no Slate Rock. No little note saying Roger Williams landed here. No, nothing. This is especially interesting too because this particular map is actually very detailed in labeling all sorts of other random rocks all over the area. Like we got Shuling Rock listed and Whale Rock and Black Rock and the White Rocks and like a billion other little specks of stone out in the bay, but they're not gonna list Slate Rock on here, which supposedly is one of the most important landmarks in the whole state, right? But I don't know, this is like, this is one of those things that I can't even begin to pretend like I have a concrete answer for, right? Like there's people out there who know way more about Slate Rock than me and way more about Roger Williams than me and even among those people, there's still plenty of disagreement on whether Roger Williams actually put his feet on Slate Rock or not. So just one of those things that I'm gonna have to leave up to you. But there is another big question that I can help you out with. See, this whole time we've been talking about Slate Rock, right? Slate Rock this, Slate Rock that. Did Roger Williams actually land on Slate Rock? Why isn't Slate Rock on this map? So by now you might be wondering, where is Slate Rock? I mean, it's clearly not in this park, right? All it's here is the monument and some grass and trees and stuff. No big rock anywhere in sight. Well, I'll tell you where Slate Rock is. It's right here. In the base of this bear statue at Brown University. And it was also donated to a museum in Warren, Massachusetts in 1898. And it was also almost used in the construction of the Rhode Island State House. And it's also up in Pilgrim Hall in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And it's also at the Rhode Island Historical Society. Okay, okay. So how did Slate Rock end up in so many places, right? Well, in 1877, they blew it up with dynamite. Not kidding. And to make matters even worse, they blew it up with dynamite while they were trying to construct the park to commemorate Slate Rock. So they're literally building a park to try to show off this cool little feature of Rhode Island history and they blow up the feature. So people just kind of like collected all the little pieces of it that were left over from the blast and started building them into things like that statue or putting them in museums. I even read something that said that stores in Providence used to sell little pieces of Slate Rock to tourists as souvenirs. Oh, and if you're wondering why they were using dynamite to try and build a park in the first place, it's because Slate Rock, like the Seekonk River, had fallen prey to land reclamation. Over the course of the couple centuries after Roger Williams established Providence, Slate Rock had been slowly but surely covered up bit by bit with dirt. So the dynamiting was actually an attempt to uncover a bunch of the rock that had been lost. They just totally misguided how much to use. I actually found a couple of really nice personal accounts of the whole story of how Slate Rock was covered and then destroyed. Like here's a good one where the author describes a day in 1845 where his father took him to Slate Rock and showed him the names that he and his uncles had carved into the face of the stone. When the author returned years later in 1880, the rock had been reduced to bits with all the pieces of people's names on them distributed back out to the original carver. Isn't that just kind of funny to think about? Like, <laughs> like imagine you're sitting at your dinner table one day and you hear a knock on your door and you open up the door and some guy's got a piece of rock with your name carved into it and you're like, hey, that looks a lot like, like Slate Rock, where I carved my name 30 years ago. How did you get that? Did you cut it out of the stone? And the guy's like, oh, pff, we would never cut it out of the stone. No, we just accidentally blew the whole thing up. So here's your 30 pound hunk of rock. See ya. That same author apparently used to take dates rowing around the rock too, and I found plenty of accounts of local children playing on it. Like Slate Rock was without a doubt a real landmark in Providence, something that its people were fond of, right? So you know, after a certain point, it really didn't matter if the story of Roger Williams was true or not, right? The rock had sort of come into its own and developed its own relationship to the people of Providence, which is undoubtedly why its pieces were spread all throughout the city, right? I mean, people had a real connection to that stone and they wanted to honor it. And sometimes it went a lot further than just a piece of the rock ending up in a museum somewhere. Bits of slate rock ended up in some pretty crazy places out there getting used in some real interesting ways. Like check this out, this is from a book on Roger Williams I found that was published back in 1919. 
It has a little section on slate rock where it just kind of casually mentions that a piece of the rock cut into the shape of a cross had been embedded in the floor of a local church here in Providence. Well, I gotta try my best to see that, right? I mean, as soon as I read that, I knew I gotta try to get my eyes on that cross. So first thing I did is I tracked down which church it was and I gave him a ring, a couple rings actually. I left a message and no response ever. I called him a couple times over the course of a couple days, never got a response. So I thought, all right, I'll just show up. So I showed up during the hours when the church was supposed to be open. I walked right up to it. Gorgeous church, by the way, I should probably add that. especially right now when uh, Providence is in the middle of its spring and all the cherry trees are blooming, just absolutely beautiful church. But anyway, I walk up to the door, I crack it open, I walk inside and pitch black, completely dark. So I'm just standing there just inside the doorway, right? Dead silence. I let out a couple feeble hellos. Hello? Hello? No response. So I just kind of turned around and went back out the door because I'm not about to just creep around an empty church by myself, all right? So you might be thinking, all right, well, what else can I do from this point? And for a bit, I was thinking that too. I was thinking, no way am I gonna get to see this cross now. But there was one option left. And you know, I don't give up easily. So I suited up in my Sunday best and I headed off to service. I mean, what else am I gonna do? I'm not gonna sneak around the church uninvited, so I gotta go there at a time when I know the lights are gonna be on and I know that I will be welcomed in. So there I am in front of the door, right? And I put my hair down to the side, I tuck in my shirt, put on a big smile, and walk in the door of the church. Right away, everyone's so welcoming and kind and everything to me. Welcome, greetings, come on in, that kind of stuff, you know? And I'm saying, hey, thank you, thank you. And the whole time I'm like covertly looking around at the floor, trying to get an eye on where the cross might be, right? And then all of a sudden, boom, there it is. Like maybe 10 feet away from the main door of the church. Like when I walked in there in the darkness, I was probably standing on top of it for a second. I just couldn't see it because it was so dark in there, right? So there's the cross. And so I just kind of stood there for a moment and I really gazed at it and memorized it, make sure I knew every detail. And then I drew this picture afterwards so you could see what it looked like. See, you might be thinking I was gonna sneak in there with my camera and covertly record the inside of the church and the, the service and everything, but A, that might be illegal, especially putting it on YouTube, and B, I, don't, I really don't like filming things without people's permission, and especially I don't like filming people without their permission, so you're just gonna have to settle for my recounting the tale on this one. But anyway, this is about what the cross looked like, right? Maybe about three feet tall, big hunks of the rock on each side and in the middle. And then there's that little circle there that has a, an inscription on it, basically just saying, this is a piece of slate rock from where Roger Williams landed in 1636. And there we go, we saw the cross, right? So technically I could have just bailed right out of there as soon as I saw it, right? Went on and tried to find the next piece of slate rock, but I decided since I'm already here, these people are so welcoming, might as well enjoy the service. So I just went and sat down in the back of a pew, stayed there for maybe 20 minutes or so, just kind of enjoyed the music they were playing. It was like a live band playing some like slow, like blues riffs pretty much while the preacher was talking over top of them. Everyone still while I'm sitting there is giving me big smiles. One old lady came up behind me, gave me a big double shoulder squeeze before she went and walked down. And like I said, hung out for 20 minutes and then I slipped away out the back of the door. But hey, guess what? That's not all. So you probably thought that that was what I was talking about at the top of the video, right? That that was the crazy place I went. And don't get me wrong, that was definitely the first time that I've ever gone to church for a video. But it gets even more wild than that. Check this out. It's the proceedings of a meeting of a Rhode Island Freemason Lodge held way back in 1860. And look at this. The latest idea that possessed the minds of the members was to set up in their lodge room two ashlers cut from the rock upon which Roger Williams first stepped when he landed in Providence. Now that's some pretty serious stuff, right? Keep in mind this is 1862. Like the stone wasn't actually dynamited until 1877. So they just literally went down there and cut some giant hunks out of slate rock all on their own, right? Pretty wild thing to do. And look at this, I found another reference to those stone ashlers too. This one from an issue of a Freemason magazine written in 1897. There are two fine specimens of the original Wutchir rock shown in the main hall of the new Masonic building in Providence. All right, so as you can probably guess, I read that 
and I was thinking, I got to do everything in my power to see if I can find at least one of these ashlers, right? This is now the holy grail of slate rock for me. So first things first, I look up, I find the phone number for the Grand Lodge of Freemasons here in Rhode Island. I give them a call and I'm able to get the Grand Secretary of the Lodge on the line. I just kind of tell them about myself, tell them I'm looking for, looking for these couple of big stone ashlers cut out of slate rock and Right away, the guy says, hey, you know what? I think I actually kind of vaguely know what you're talking about here. Let me get you in touch with the grand librarian of the lodge. He might be able to help you further. So I'm thinking, holy cow, there's a chance I might actually be able to find these 170-year-old stone ashlers with my only starting point being a, just some random record from a meeting of the Freemasons, right? So I email the, the grand librarian, I say, hey, any chance you got these couple of stone ashlers laying around somewhere? Any chance you might know where they are? Less than a day later, a guy emails me back, we got them, come on down. So boom, I'm there as soon as possible, right? So I hop out of my car and I'm looking up at the great big Grand Lodge, right? Holy cow, I've never been in something like this. Am I really about to see the inside of a Grand Lodge for the first time? And I, am I really about to find this big hunk of rock that I'm looking for in here? So I walk in there, I walk up to the secretary and I say, hey, I got an appointment with Rick. Could you please show me where his office is? And they say, yeah, it's right over there. Walk up to the door, give it a knock, tap, tap, tap. Door opens and there's Rick, the Grand Librarian of the Grand Lodge. And he's got a big smile on his face. And let me tell you, right away, I like this guy. He starts talking to me like we've known each other for years. He's just so welcoming, so kind. I can tell he's so excited to show me this stuff. And I'm excited to be there. So I'm just matching his energy, right? And we're just going back and forth and talking like old friends. And he says, hey, I'll show you where the Ashler is. It's on the other side of the building over here. So we start walking through the building, right? And every couple of feet, Rick's stopping to show me some other new amazing thing that just happens to be on the wall of the lodge or something, right? He's like, look at this, it's da 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 da. Look at this, it's da 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 da. And I'm just in total awe looking at all this amazing stuff, feeling so blessed that this guy is taking time out of his day to show me all this great stuff, right? My favorite thing is actually this mural that's on the walls of one of the rooms, right? And Rick explains to me that this mural was painted to sort of like represent the Rhode Island countryside, right? Like uh, agrarian life in Rhode Island. But Rick pointed out, there's these big giant hills in the background. There is nowhere in Rhode Island that has hills like that. Anyway though, we get up to the main hall. And like I said, I have never been inside anything like this building, right? And oh, man, I cannot describe to you what it felt walking into that room for the first time. Oh man, here we go. This is probably the coolest thing that I've ever got to do for this YouTube channel. chairs for the leaders of the lodge to sit in, big beautiful murals, this really cool like moody lighting in the whole building, it, it just really spectacular stuff. So I'm just in there with Rick and, and also this other guy Dave who I should thank too who was uh, another member of the lodge who was also extremely kind and extremely generous to talk to me and show me all this stuff right and both these guys are just you know, a wealth of knowledge. I'm asking them all these questions and they're answering everything. And they tell me that I can take shots of anything I want in the whole building, right? So I'm just in there going to town, getting all these great shots. And the whole time Rick and Dave are like, they're doing their best to help me great get great shots, right? It was really fun. Like Rick even offered to hold the camera for me so I can get some shots of me walking around the hall. The best part though is there's like this set of like light switches in the corner of the room, right? And Rick goes over there and he starts flipping all these switches. 
and the lighting is changing all these beautiful colors and everything. He's like, hey, would it look cool in your shots if those clouds up there were purple? And what do you know, it looks awesome. He's like, hey, would it be cool if we had lights over here and lights over here? Would it be cool if like the, the window had like a, a blue light behind it? Would that look cool? Rick also told me a kind of cool little anecdote about the monument too, the Roger Williams Landing Monument. See those bronze plates on it there? See, I had known that those had been stolen in the past in the 1970s, right? But what Rick told me is that they were actually stolen as like a, a part of a string of thefts of bronze plates off of statues and monuments all across the city. Apparently some guys were sneaking up there, stealing them, and then taking them across the state line into Massachusetts to get melted down in this like crooked metal refinery, right? But all right, now it's time to show you what we came here for, right? The Ashler cut from Slate Rock. This marble slab was presented by P.M. Thomas Wilmark. This stone was cut from the rock upon which Roger Williams, the founder of the state of Rhode Island, landed in Providence, A.D. 1636, and presented to Roger Williams Lodge, number 32, A.F. and A.N., by Brother Frank C. Angel, to commemorate an important epoch in history and as a fit token of esteem for the one after whom this lodge received its name. So how do we wrap this up, right? Like, what's the takeaway here? Well, I'd like to go back to where we started, the monument. You see, over the course of making this video, the way I viewed and thought about this thing like really started to change over time. Because think about it, like what is this even a monument to anymore? It's a monument to a story about Roger Williams that might not be true. It's a monument to a rock that doesn't even exist anymore. And it's a monument to a spot where a boat might have landed that's now hundreds of feet from the water. Literally no physical aspect of the story that this thing is supposed to commemorate exists anymore. Nothing. But does that really matter? Because would I have even decided to make this video if I didn't see that monument first? And would I have got to see the inside of that beautiful church? Would I have got to learn about this great debate over Providence's history? Would I have got to meet Rick and see a Grand Lodge for the first time in my life? Probably not, right? So big fella, I don't really care that you're not really a monument to anything anymore. You still mean a lot to me. So thank you. And thank you for watching.